You know, the threat of fear challenges us to go back to our surest faith. We can say that we're trusting the Lord. We can say that we're Christians and we believe God, that God cares for us and we're trusting God. But then there's a threat. And when there's a threat, we go back to our surest faith. Some years ago, before I finally retired from tennis, because it was irritating my back, I had to give up on tennis. I was quite an avid follower of the game. Not, never a good tennis player, but I tried. I thought I would take uh, tennis lessons because my game wasn't very powerful. I grew up playing ping pong, and I, I sort of swung the tennis racket like a ping pong racket. It's more wrist, you see, in ping pong than it is the whole shoulder that you would use when you're swinging in tennis. And the tennis pro said, Jim, you just got to trust your shoulder. You got to swing with your whole shoulder. Keep your arm fairly straight and firm and then swing through the ball with your shoulder. Okay, it's hitting it really well. Boy, those shots felt good. Then I got into the game. And I was hitting some good shots with these big swings from my shoulder and uh, doing well. But then the game got tight. It got to the last part of the game. It was just neck and neck who was going to win the game. And the last few shots, I thought, I've got to get these shots in. You know what I did? Ping pong. Ping pong. It was back to little wrist shots, you see. And I lost the game. Now, what happened? Push comes to shove. When my faith was tested, I didn't go for the shoulder shot anymore. Went back to those little dink shots with my wrist, you see, and it didn't work. That's what often happens to us. When faith is tested, that's the real testing and proving point as to whether we're going to trust in the Lord, we're going to go back to the old ways of doing it. If self-reliance is primary in my life and that's what I trust the most, then we're, I'm going to be limited by my ability to understand I cannot trust in the Lord. How can I understand a God that I can't really rationalize? I can't get my mind around God. So many people say that. Well, if you could get your mind around God, think about it. He would be an exceedingly small God, wouldn't he? Think about that. If God isn't bigger than your mind, we're all in trouble. Because our minds are small computers. We need to let God be bigger than that. And he is bigger than that. He's bigger than my mind. Our ability to see. And the Bible tells us that the spiritual unseen world is the real world. And it's far, far bigger than this world that we live in. The Bible says that the heavens and the stars are the work of God's fingers. He's just a little bit of dust that he sprinkled from his fingers. Now, how big is a God who sprinkles the heavens with his fingers? Our God is huge, far bigger than the physical creation. And to think that we can be limited, can't trust beyond what we can see. Thomas was like that, doubting Thomas. Because we're, we limit ourselves by what we can understand, by what, what we can see, we're going to be plagued by doubts. And we're going to be plagued by fears because our faith will be very small indeed. And some of us are limited because it's only what I can control. We talked about controlling behaviors, the control of our minds, the control of others. And many people in their fear, mothers, fathers, other family members, they seek to control all the people around them. I know a mother who wouldn't let her children go out after dark and they were almost teenagers. Why? Well, there's danger out there. The children were upset by the mother's controlling this. And it was all because of fear. She couldn't let go. She had to be in control of, of those children. When I'm afraid, it says in Psalm 56, verse 3, I will trust in you. Psalm 18, verse 2, the Lord is my rock. I remember a woman who in counseling said this, I remember when my anxiety started. It started when my father died. Why was that? My father was my rock. My father was my rock. He was the one that stabilized me. He's the one that I could go to when I was really in distress. And when I lost him, that foundation of my life gave way. And ever since then, I've had anxiety in my life. She needs a new rock. And fortunately, the Lord is a rock. It's not just the object of faith that we need to consider, but it's how much faith we have. And that's the subjective component of faith. Faith is like a muscle. 
it requires exercise to become strong. How do we get strong with our physical muscles of our arms and legs? We exercise them. And that is exactly why God allows conflicts and trials in life. Why? Because he's seeking to make us strong in faith. We need exercise. We need to be tested. We need to go through trials so that we can become strong in faith. That is the exercise of our, our faith. For many people who have had trouble and trauma in life, they experience a disease called post-traumatic stress disorder. And that is fear that pervades them from past memories. And they can't get past the memories. And immediately, when they're faced with some struggle in life, those terrible memories of fear come back into their life, like soldiers who have been in Afghanistan and they've been in the middle of war and they've seen terrible atrocities and they've seen their friends uh, die and they come back to Canada and as soon as they hear a loud noise on the street, immediately it reminds them of gunfire and they're back into the terrible trauma. And those people are given a course of what's called desensitizing therapy desensitizing therapy. They're given a moderate noise and they have to cope with that noise. Then they're given a little bit of a stronger noise. They have to cope with that noise and they learn how to get back to experiencing loud noises without thinking that it's gunfire. It's desensitization therapy. Do you know what? That's what the Lord is doing in my life. He's desensitizing me to fear and he's sensitizing me to faith. He's asking me to go through the graded exercises of learning to face my fears, learning to confront the things that I'm afraid of in life, and learning to get the victory. And he does it in graded ways so that I can bear it. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear, but he will, with the temptation, make the way of escape so that you can bear it. God is patiently bringing me through trials, not to destroy me, but to make me strong in faith, to have strong spiritual muscles. This is desensitization therapy. How to get more faith. So what is my job when it comes to building my faith? You know, the first thing to do is so obvious, it's, I I just have to tell you. How do you get more faith? And maybe some of you are going to ask me that question. It's a simple answer. Ask. Ask. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Ask, and you shall, what? Receive. Ask. Ask. Ask in faith for faith. There's a man who brought his terribly sick child, his terribly sick boy to the Lord. The Lord said, do you believe? And the man said, I believe. Help my unbelief. And the man expressed that asking of God. The man came and asked in faith for the Lord to heal his boy, and the boy was healed. First thing, if you want to get more faith, is to just have the courage and the trust in God to ask. The second thing is to seek. And this is where I need to do something on my part. I need to be determined to do what the Lord wants me to do. He may want me to seek for answers in his word. He may want me to seek for some good counsel from uh, people around me. He may want me to do various things, but that is beyond asking. And then the last thing it says in this verse, Matthew 7, verse 7, is knock and the door will be opened. Some people have wondered, what is the idea of knocking? Well, when you're knocking... You're facing a closed door. You can't go any farther. And so you have to be patient and wait. And that's what knocking is all about. I am going to wait because sometimes God does not answer prayers like that. He doesn't answer prayers as soon as we ask him. Sometimes there's a period of time. And what is the period of time all about? It's all about God's timing. It's all about him increasing our faith and seeking to develop not only faith but patience in us we're waiting for God to open the door this is the way to get more faith ask seek and knock how do I seek for faith I focus on the truth it's the first thing Peter had to learn when uh, he was trying to walk on the water 
Jesus came in the night and he was walking on the water and Peter said, I want to do that too. Wouldn't that be neat to be able to walk on the water? I know sometimes, you know, we, we skate on the ice that's sort of walking on Canadian water in the wintertime. But that doesn't count, does it? But to be able to walk on the water would be really neat. And Peter got to do it. But as long as his eye was on the Lord, he was walking on the water because that was the faith that kept him up. As soon as he started getting distracted by the wind and the waves, down he went. And so it is so important to keep your eye on the Lord first. Most important thing in the Christian life, the most important facet of living by faith is focus on the Lord first and keep focusing on him. And when you're in trouble, confess the truth. Do not confess the lie like that girl did when she was faced with a loss at school, when she was faced with failure, she said, oh, my father was right. I am a failure. I can't make it in school. And as soon as she confessed the lie, down she went. And when she started to confess the truth, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, she started to get built up again. Not only that, but act on the truth. Act on the truth. Here is a wonderful statement. Here it is. What you really believe is what you confess and act on. Now, you can say you believe, but what you really believe is what you confess and act on. That's it. Now, that's the test of faith. Acting obediently, acting courageously, and doing what the Lord wants us to do, that is the true test of faith. A fearful man had lived as a bachelor through much of his life. And then finally there was a young lady who came into his life and she seemed to be the perfect one that God had provided for him. So after a long time of trying to work through the fears and the struggles and the trepidations of his life that had kept him unmarried for so many years, he finally popped the question and he asked the girl to marry him. But it wasn't without a great deal of soul searching. It wasn't without a great deal of fear. Came to the day of the wedding. And by the way, this man was a thinker. He would often ponder in his mind which is the right way to go. And he had trouble making decisions. He often vacillated about doing things. He lived in his mind. The pastor came to him and said, Do you take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife? Silence. So after an appropriate time, he said again, do you take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife? Silence. And he said it a third time. And finally the man said, I'm thinking. (laughs) Well, he did get married and they lived happily ever after. We can get paralyzed by thinking. That's called the paralysis of analysis, right? We can get paralyzed with that and not do anything. We need to act. We need to do what God wants us to do. We need to do it in spite of our fears. And then the Lord will come through for us. So there's a new pathway. Remember the old pathway when there's a fright, we get adrenaline stimulation. And the old pathway said there's only two ways to go. We either run or we fight. The third pathway now that we're delineating is the pathway of faith. You go to the Lord and you call on him for faith and then you move forward. Now there's faith and there's courage and those two things go together. Faith is the believing aspect and courage is the emotional aspect. Courage is what really combats fear because courage or boldness is the emotional counterpart to faith. Faith is an act of the will, and courage is the emotional counterpart to that. The Bible talks about peace that passes understanding, and we can get that understanding if we have courage and peace in our heart, and we're asking him as often as we feel the need. It says in Philippians chapter 4, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Every fearful believer needs to memorize Philippians 4, 6, and 7. It's telling us to call on the Lord, and God will give us this mighty peace that passes all understanding. He will give us the courage to overcome. 
So let's illustrate this with a diagram. When I'm facing a danger and my heart is tempted to fear, I can go up to the Lord and I can ask the Lord to intervene and to remove the danger and bring me through the danger. He will give me grace to deal with the situation. Now that is understandable peace. If the danger recedes and you've asked the Lord to help you and God brings you through and the danger recedes and you have peace, that's understandable peace. But in Philippians 4, he's talking about a peace that even transcends that. He's talking about not only praying that the Lord remove the danger, he's talking about praying for peace in your heart as you face the danger. And when you have peace in your heart as you face the danger, this is an understandable peace anymore. This is peace that passes understanding. You shouldn't be so peaceful. You shouldn't be so calm in your soul. My wife is a gentle soul. And I married her because she's a gentle soul. She's a lovely lady. But I don't normally think of her as courageous, and yet she is courageous, because she's gentle. She was showing some medical students from Canada our beautiful Zambezi River. And what she didn't understand at the place that she was at was that there was a soldier encampment of Zambian soldiers right near the border with Angola, a sensitive area. Suddenly, a couple of soldiers came out from the bush beside the river, and they trained machine guns on Kathy and the, the two medical students. Have you ever had a machine gun pointed at your head? And what, uh, what made matters worse is that they'd been enjoying some of the local brew for a little while that afternoon, and they were quite drunk. So here's two drunken soldiers with machine guns, and they're pointed at her head. Kathy called on the Lord. Lord, calm me down. Give me grace. Now, you shouldn't have peace in a situation like that. But from the recounting of the medical students, they said, your wife just spoke so calmly to the soldiers and just said, we are missionaries from Chitokoloki Hospital. Put your guns down. And she repeated it a couple of times, and they put their guns down. Oh, to have that courage to be under fire, <laughs> to be able to have that peace. You know, when you call on the Lord for peace, he'll give you that kind of courage. You call on him for courage, he will give you that courage. This is the third aspect of overcoming fear. The third remedy is the practice of respect. Respect is a fear word. A lot of people don't understand that respect really is fear. It's fear. The word respect is a compound word. It comes from the base word spect. These are spectacles, glasses, okay? Talk about spectator sports, things we watch. So it's the idea of looking when we use the word spec. Respect is just the amplified. Look very carefully. That's what respect means. Look very carefully. Why would you want to look carefully? Because there's a danger to be avoided. So respect is the fear that comes when you look attentively at a danger at a possible danger, and you make the right kind of response to that fear. An example might be uh, you're coming to a railway crossing, a level railway crossing. Suddenly, the bells start going at the railway crossing, and the lights start flashing, and then the armature comes down over the road. What's all that fuss and bother about anyway? Well, it's trying to get your attention so that you will fear a little bit of fear. And at least you'll feel enough fear of what might happen should you go through past the armature so that you stop. Because if you don't feel that fear and stop and you go around, as some crazy people are wont to do, you're likely to get hit by a 100,000 tons of steel and be flattened. When I was a kid, a baker who delivered bread to our home was crossing at a level crossing near us, and he didn't have enough fear. And he didn't see 
or didn't care to stop when the, the lights were flashing and the bell was going and the armature came down. He went around it and there was bread for half a mile along the railroad tracks as he got hit by the train. What happened? Not enough respect. Not enough respect. Respect is a fear that leads me to obey, that leads me to do the right thing. And the idea is that it's this little fear, this fear called respect, at the beginning saves me from a big fear at the end. A story of a lack of respect. My buddy Ron and I were going fishing on the Zambezi River, and we'd heard that there was some big fish just down river. And so we took our little boat there, and we put our boat in, and as soon as we got the, the engine on and we got the, the boat going, we realized why there were big fish at this part of the river. There was a herd of hippo in the river. Now, you may not understand the association between hippo and fish, and, but this is the way it goes. It's sort of a cycle of life. The hippo poop in the river, and the little fish eat the poop, and the big fish eat the little fish. So where you have hippo, you have big fish. It doesn't sound appetizing, but that's the way it is, you see. At that point of time, we should have remembered that the hippo is responsible for more deaths than lions, more deaths than snakes, more deaths than any other creature, more deaths than crocodiles, more deaths than any other creature in Africa. The hippo is the most dangerous creature. But we're here to fish, and there's big fish. So we start trolling up and down. It's wonderful. We're catching one big fish after the other. And then the engine conks out. And we just happen to be upriver, up current from this herd of hippo. We start going down the river towards these massive creatures. And a great big bull hippo opens his mouth. Now, we're not talking Disney World anymore, right? <laughs> Do you know what the uvula is? It's the little, the little waggy part at the back of the throat. I have seen a hippo's uvula. Because it looks like we, we were going to disappear right into his mouth. Just as we were coming towards this giant creature, down he went and we glided over his back and we went that farther down river. There were some disappointed crocodiles on either side of the, the river because they fully expected that we would be in the water and we would be served for lunch. No respect. No respect. I tell you this, you see, if you don't have respect, you will live in fear. That day, because we didn't have respect, that was one of the, that was one of the worst fears I could ever remember. I came so close to death on that day because I did not observe respect. You know who the most fearful people are? on the 407 or the, the 401, it's the people who are furtively looking around for the police because they're exceeding the speed limit. <laughs> now, if you practice respect and you went at a reasonable pace, you see, you would not have that great fear because you are going too fast and therefore you're afraid and you're looking around. Where is the, Where is he? I'm going to get caught. There's a continuum of fear, and I, I'm just going to show you that the Lord doesn't want us to live on the negative side of this fear. There's a negative side where there's horror and panic and terror. That's an awful place to be, living in that kind of fear. And a lesser fear, we would call it anxiety. Anxiety is a lesser fear than horror and panic, and many, many Canadians live in that area, on that continuum. That's where they camp in the anxiety part. There's a positive fear. It's a very protective fear. And the most positive fear that is mentioned in the Bible is reverence. Reverence is a fear. It's the fear of the Lord. It's that sense of awe at being in the presence of God. And so many, many people in the scriptures experienced a reverence. Jesus himself is said to have had reverent fear. You can read it in Hebrews chapter 5. Reverent fear. Now, just back off from reverent fear, and you get this fear that's called respect. And this is where God wants us, in most of the issues of our life, to camp. He wants us to camp with respect. When I have that level of fear in my life, a positive, gentle fear, where I respect the dangers, 
the moral dangers. I respect the civil dangers. I respect the emotional dangers. I respect the danger to life and limb. I respect the dangers that can come when I am careless in relationships. When I respect those things, you see, I live in peace. I live in peace. I don't get out of line. I'm I'm living with respect. It's such an important concept. The Bible says the wicked man flees, though no one pursues. But the righteous, the people who practice respect, are as bold as a lion. Whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. Why? Because he's practicing, she's practicing respect. The last issue is the practice of love. And this deserves a whole seminar, and I believe that this is a seminar that I have yet to do. I've I've got to put one together on love and respect. The practice of love is the fourth curative when it comes to fear, and it's such a powerful curative for fear, the practice of love. What is love? Love is not a Hollywood feeling. It's not that sense of gush, that sense of excitement you get when you first meet the, the woman or the man of your dreams. Love is a commitment to give a blessing. Real love is a decision that you're going to give something good to somebody. That's what real love is. And it says it in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, love is a commitment to give a blessing. So it's not a feeling, it's an act of the will and a choice. And when I practice love, I can actually overcome fear. And so it says in the scriptures, perfect love casts out fear. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. How does it do that? Well, let's look at it this way. When I'm operating in fear, it leads me to a certain goal. And the goal, if I operate in fear, is survival, self-protection. And people who live in fear, this is what they're doing. They're protecting themselves. I've got to survive. I've got to protect myself. I've got to take care of myself. In many ways, we need to do that. But if that's the main preoccupation of our life, we're like this. See, we're protecting ourselves. Now, when I'm living in love, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm operating like this, with arms open, giving, giving to others. Your choice. You can live in fear this way, or you can live in love this way. You know what the Bible calls us to do? Live in love. That's how Jesus came. He came with arms open. Arms like this. You cannot love when you're living in a huddle of self-protection because all you're caring about is surviving. But the Lord didn't come to this world to survive. He came to give himself to love and to give himself as a ransom for many. He came to open his arms to love. I'm reminded of a story of a woman who was camping in the hills of British Columbia with her 11-year-old son. And as they were walking down the trail, they were accosted by a huge grizzly bear. And the grizzly bear attacked the son, the smaller of the two. And he was about to pounce on the son. And what did the mother do? She didn't retreat in fear. She ran at that grizzly bear and she distracted him from attacking her son. The son was able to get away. The mother, unfortunately, died in that accident. That was reported some years ago. It had a profound effect on me because I thought, what would I do if I was there walking with my son? I would like to think that I would respond in love, not in fear. I would like to think that I would interpose myself between the bear and my child. Not respond fearfully, but respond lovingly. We have the choice. And when you choose to love, God will give you the courage to overcome your fear. Because he wants us to love. He wants us to be lovers. So how do we move from fear to love? We dedicate ourselves and our emotions to love. You ever said, Lord, make me a better lover? See, because fearful people like this can't be great lovers. They're too busy protecting themselves. Lord, give me the courage to to love. I'm going to open my arms to love. When afraid, choose to practice the love of God through worship. That's what I did when I was getting the MRI done. I worship God. When afraid, just call on the Lord. Remind yourself of God. And then choose to love others for the sake of loving God. 
when I open my arms to love like that, now I am truly free. Because when I'm living in love, I am living in life. Perfect love casts out fear. We're going to take a couple of minutes to collect the questions. The, the fireworks start to happen when we have the questions and answers. I had been physically abused by my in-laws about 18 years ago. I thought I had gotten over it by the grace of God, but recently I started to relive the experience again when my father-in-law was hospitalized and the thought of having my mother-in-law under one roof started to haunt me. For years, I managed to suppress it, but it's obvious now that I haven't totally gotten rid of the experience in my system what to do. Well, as I mentioned, the treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder, which is very likely here, the experiences that she had with the mother-in-law. So she's remembering these things, and that memory comes up before her and forms a block. She can't operate because she's afraid. What she needs to do is pray for courage, needs to pray for faith. And every time she remembers, she needs to know the truth. It's just a memory. The, the former experiences are just a memory, and she needs to pray for the courage to overcome. Every time you feel the fear that comes out of a past memory, you need courage. You need courage. Lord, take that fear. Give me peace. Calm me down. Lord, take that fear. Calm me down. Let's all say it. It's so easy. Just take that fear. Calm. Lord, take that fear. Calm me down. Take that fear. Calm me down. Just a common prayer like that. And that's the kind of prayer that she needs when she's haunted by the fear that comes up before her. If you keep praying and reading the Bible, yet your worry and anxiety still is here, what can you do? Worry, as described in the Bible, is a sin of the mind. It says in Matthew chapter 13, verse 22, the Lord's own words, he calls worry a weed in the garden of the soul. It's a noxious, unwanted plant. It's wrong. Worry is just wrong because the Lord says not to do it. Now, fear is not always wrong. We've learned that. But worry is always wrong. It's me taking control and not allowing the Lord to govern. So what I have learned to do, because as I told you, I'm a worrier, I have learned to call it sin and go to the Lord and say, Lord, I did it again. I'm worrying. Would you forgive me and would you cleanse me? And I choose to trust you right now. Would you forgive me? Because I'm trying to control things with my mind. I'm worrying. I'm not trusting you. Would you forgive me for that? And would you cleanse me? I'm going to tr choose to trust you right now. Now, if you would do that and start calling your worry wrong, I think you'll get some good victory over it. There's a, another part to that question. How can I make a decision for those people who try to eliminate Wrong decision, avoid bad things happening and try to control things. It seems that for these people who are anxious and worried, it's very difficult for them to make daily needs decisions. Any way to help them, any practical things to do for them. Once again, when people are fearful, you pray for them. You ask the Lord to give them courage, give them strength to overcome their fears because you can't always be there to do what you you have to do for them. When they're children, you can help them. You see, when they're adults, they have to learn how to call on the Lord for themselves. The important thing to do is to pray for them. Another thing you can do is encourage them with God's word. I have a lady who, from time to time, gives me verses, and they've been very helpful for me. And often those verses meet me right at my point of need. She just gives me a verse, comes in for counseling and she often blesses me more than I bless her. She just says, here's a verse I found. Here's a verse I got. That verse ministers to me. So just be gracious and patient and help the faint-hearted with prayer for them and seeking to encourage them with words. My daughter is in a highly stressful job and is often depressed, needing medication and psychoanalysis. She has now quit this job and seems so much happier. Is this her way out of fear. It's not wrong to run. And sometimes in the scriptures, people had to run. The apostle Paul had to run from Damascus because he was being chased. 
And sometimes it is wisdom to know when you've had enough and you're over your head and you're being threatened with life and limb and to run. This girl obviously knew her limits and she'd gone beyond her limits and she chose to run and she's happier. Now, if she's running away from all fears and she's running away from responsibility, that's something different. But you know what? You don't have to stay at that job if it's killing you. You can quit your job. Trust in the Lord and he'll find you a better job. How do you tell people that they have anxiety? (laughs) Well, remember, be nice because we've all got anxieties. (laughs) So you might start by saying, you know, you've got something that we all have. (laughs) It's called fear, all right? Or you could use anxiety. That's the $100 word. You see, fear is just the regular word. I think you've got some fear in your life. Now, my wife, you see, told me that several times when we were getting ready to go on those trips in Zambia. I would say, no, I don't have any fear. But inside, I was learning the truth. And she had the boldness to tell me exactly what I was feeling. I was feeling fear. And you know, if you don't admit the fear, you don't call on the Lord for the courage. If you're busy avoiding it, if you're busy denying it, you're not going to get the remedy because you're not going to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm afraid. I will trust in you, Lord, I'm afraid. That's what David, the big macho king of Israel in Psalm 56, verse 3, said, I'm afraid, Lord, I need to trust in you. Men, especially, admit your fear, call on the Lord. How to help a person with depression, what to say, which is appropriate. Can you explain forgiveness is forgetting from the handout? I think I passed over that one. Forgiveness is is forgetting. You know what? The seminar from the, the previous month deals with all of that, but I'm going to give you a 30-second capsule on it. Forgiveness is a legally binding transaction where you surrender a right to collect on a debt. If you go to your bank manager and you ask her what is the definition of forgiveness, she'll tell you something like that. The Bible and God views sin as indebtedness. That's why it says in the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are debtors against us. So sin brings a sense of indebtedness. And if you're the one who's done the sinning against me, then you're in debt to me and I'm the creditor. I'm the creditor. It's not godly for me just to forget about that account. I need to bring that account to the Lord and I need to say, Lord, I forgive. I give up the right to collect on this account. I put it in your hands. God is teaching us how to deal with accounts of sin through the grace of forgiveness. It is not about forgetting it. If you just forget it, you're not learning the lesson of dealing with sin by righteousness and by grace. So people who just forget about it, they're avoiding the issue. TV shows, movies, love to increase our fears. The world, that the world will end December 2012. Did you know the world's going to end in, in December 2012? What they don't know is that the Lord could come back before then. A lot of people fear that. TV shows like to get people to watch. That's what it's all about. And if they can cause fear uh, and some paranoia, then you're going to listen. How many people listen to Radio 680 for the news? I still listen to it, you know, but there's a guy on there who really bothers me because he always says, and it's going to come today. You better be afraid. You know, he's kind of raises his voice like, wake up, be afraid. You know, I thought, come on, fella, you're... <laughs> You already got my attention. Don't make me afraid. That's what they do in mass marketing of these television shows. They're trying to get you to watch. If they can make you afraid, they're going to get more viewers. Times have changed. We no longer allow our kids to play outside on their own or with other kids without our supervision. They are put into programs and we feel safer. Is it wrong to tell our children to be fearful of strangers, beware of what is on the Internet, etc.? Is this respect fear or are we putting... a inappropriate fear in our kids, will they grow up to be healthy adults if we do this? We must teach respect. We must teach our children respect. We, not, we must teach them that the danger is there. We must teach them that in avoiding the danger, they will save their lives. And when it comes to watching stuff that's inappropriate, when it comes to so much that's on the Internet, which is just deadly 
and terribly degrading, we need to obviously teach our children to stay away from stuff like that. We're teaching them respect. And when they live in respect, they will avoid the terrible tragedy that many people get. They get addicted to such stuff and they get into terrible bondage in their life. So, yes, teach your children this kind of fear. Teach them to trust the people who are trustworthy. Teach them to be doubtful of people who they don't know. All of these things are very important in in our day and age. We have to be aware of the dangers. That is good fear. It's not bad fear. Above all, though, tell them to trust the Lord for their life. Because it's not about avoidance of fear, remember? It's about serving God. Maybe that stranger needs to be welcomed with love. So you teach them the opposite as well. Teach them to be gracious and welcoming to people within the boundaries of being careful. How can I love again when I have been cheated, misused, misunderstood, abused, and abandoned before? That's tough. And I'm sorry to hear that, okay? But this happens in life, that we treat one another so badly and we're wounded and we're beaten. Just remember this. The Lord says, I can heal the brokenhearted. I can bind up their wounds. Have you asked the Lord to heal your heart and restore your soul? Because here's the message, you see. Loving is living. Living is loving. And if you spend the rest of your life protecting yourself because of fear of being hurt again, you won't live. When you commit to love for the sake of serving the Lord, God will open up your heart and open up your life again. Is social anxiety an introverted personality? Yes. Should you try to change? Yes. You want to know why? It's living this way or living with open arms. Self-protectively, social anxiety disorder, common disorder, okay? And it leads people to go into their shells, into their cocoons and live introvertedly. Now, if you're a Christian and you've got social anxiety disorder and you get to heaven, you're going to be in for a shock because heaven heaven is going to be a place where everybody's rubbing shoulders with one another. We're all enjoying good fellowship together. You see how incongruous it is for the true life in the spirit. And so people with social anxiety disorder need to work on it. Don't just accept that and say, well, that's the way I am. Lord, open up my heart. Lord, I'm going to reach out in love. Lord, I'm going to learn to call on the Lord for faith and courage. And I'm going to overcome that bondage to fear. One would rather die than speak in public. How can we overcome the fear of public speaking? Well, you can't overcome the fear of public speaking unless you get up and speak publicly. All right? <laughs> you, you have to face your fear, you see. And so look for opportunities when you can speak publicly if you want to overcome that fear. You look for an opportunity to share good things with others. It could be the good thing of the gospel. It could be just, just reaching out to other people and just expressing uh, how much you care for them. See, Look for opportunities to speak publicly. And before you go in there, say, Lord, I'm going to do this for you and I'm going to pray for the courage to do it. And Lord, I'm going to do it. And then the Lord will bless you and he will give you the ability to speak publicly if you want to do that for him. While parents' love is imperfect and the child's view to love God is limited, how does perfect love cast out Fear, work. Well, I think I've just been describing it, you see. This is how it works. When I'm committed to love, God empowers me with his grace to love. He wants me to do it. He wants me to become a lover. Read 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 to 21. 1 John chapter 4, 7 to 21. It tells us God is a lover. God sent Jesus to love us. We should love one another And when we love one another, we truly live. That is the message of 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 to 21. Fantastic to close with that. That's a wonderful appellation. Let's just do what God calls us to do. Let's be done with living in a fearful avoidance. Let's learn to love one another. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. We pray your rich blessing on all those who have heard this message. Help us, each one, Lord, to take what you want us to learn out of these words and to apply them to our lives, that we might be men and women who walk in courage and faith and practice godly respect and have love in our hearts because we're walking in the light. We commend ourselves to your care in Jesus' name. Amen.